thank you so much for this invitation. It's uh, kind of interesting that the topic is very much, um, I mean, when Spencer cannot come to a conference because of snow and uh, this kind of thing, you sort of think, well, what are we going to do instead, you know? And um, so talking about uh, changing, you know, the, the, the changing environment, uh, the world heating up and so on is, uh, is a good topic. Um, I'm also pleased to be here because I just had a knee replacement done last month. And I thought, oh, well, I thought, I don't know if I can make connections this year, but if I can't, Spencer will take over for me. <laughs> So we've done some things together, and then I suddenly thought, oh no, he's got, stuck it to me again. You know, he even brought in a snowstorm to <laughs> get me to do all the work. Anyway, um, we're going to talk today about green career development, and uh, that's something that I'm really interested in, the idea of looking at career development through a green lens. And traditionally, you know, Green has kind of been looked at around renewable, renewable energy and, uh, you know, the, and black energy is the fossil fuel. But it's much bigger than that and today, you know, green is associated with lots of different things. It's uh, clean energy and holistic approaches and so on. So the idea that we could take this, I mean, what does, what does this, what does going green mean for career development? Does it have any connection to us? How do we, you know, other than just, you know, recycling the paper in the office, what, what do you do with that? Is there an opportunity here to sort of start thinking differently and maybe to, uh, you know, to, to um, develop some strategies that will really infuse that into what we do? So the green perspective is really talking about interdependence. You know, you have uh, the e economics, the social factors, the ecosystem. All of this is all working together. So I think the understanding of um, going green is something that's much, much bigger today than, um, than just talking about fossil fuels. And I think we can start to take this and apply it to career development and apply it to the kind of work we've done and are doing. Now somebody called uh, Dr. Peter Plant, and some of you have heard of him, he's got an interesting name for somebody who talks about career, green career development. Um, he, he has, I guess, coined the term career, green career development uh, some 15 years ago or something like that. Excuse me, I'm from the West Coast and it's still waking up this morning, so it takes me a while to get going. But um, anyway, he, uh, he's got some ideas about green career development that um, are kind of interesting. I think I would take it a little bit further than he has, but uh, let's just start with what he's talking about. And he's got these four principles here. The, First thing is to look at your own practice. I mean, what are you doing in your own offices? And he talks about the fact that, you know, are we green in terms of how we handle material and, you know, are we wireless and so on in the office? He, the next part that he, he mentions is the awareness of what's the environmental impact of vocational choices. What does it mean to, ch to make certain choices? What does that mean for the environment? And the need to share information widely and to use ethical as well as economic assessment methods. So can we look at, at, look at the impact we make, not just in terms of dollars and cents, but what about ethical assessment? And, and are we willing to take that into consideration? And I think these are what is it? This is now 2016, so this is time to start doing that. It's time to start thinking that way. So what's happening today? Well, people have been alluding to the, the UN Climate Change Conference in Paris, a very big event, uh, something that's, uh, I think, going to change our world. It's, people are finally waking up and 
agreeing to something that um, this was the largest group of world leaders that has ever been, 195 of them. And, uh, and, I, and I love the uh, quote from Obama who said, it was an act of defiance in the face of terrorism. The fact that this conference actually happened, because there was some question about should they have a conference on, on this at all, given the stuff that went on a few weeks before that. And the end result was, a, and I think this is a really an important quote, a historic, durable, an ambitious agreement to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, limiting global warming. So this is, a, this is a big deal. This is something that's going to change the nature of how we work, uh, you know, what's going on in our world, and career development, I think, needs to be a part of it. In the coming year, all the countries have been sent back, they, I think they have till April, uh, 2017 to actually kind of, uh, you know, they've signed on yes, but they have to ratify the agreement. So it'll be meeting with provinces and things like that in Canada and whatever they do in other countries. And so there's going to be a renewed focus on green initiatives. How can we become green and do things differently? And what I see happening is that people are starting to accept that more. I mean, there's there's a sense that, oh yeah, this, this makes sense. People are, are taking it uh, on as kind of like it's about time. And it's interesting because, I mean, I still remember the years where people talked about, is there such a thing as climate change really? And then we've had all these storms and we've had this and that and the weather's been so unpredictable. It's really getting to the point now where you can't really say, that, hey, is this, is this really happening or is this just a... Uh, some kind of a political plot, you know, to, to uh, get more money out of us in some way. So, I think there's a lot of hope for what's going on. This is the Eiffel Tower and the uh, For the Planet. You know, this is something that uh, we're, we're doing. We're going to take that on as an as a, uh, obligation, and I think we're a part of that. We are a piece of what's going to be happening in terms of a green initiative. So how, do, how does career development fit into being green? What does that actually mean? And, um, and probably the most obvious is that there's going to be different jobs emerging and skill sets required. There's already lots of different uh, discussions about how work will change. I mean, what does it mean if you are driving a car in a, you know, using a battery powered car or something like this, how does that change the kind of things that mechanics do? You know what, they're gonna do something very different. Some of the, the um, I should, probably should never have used mechanics because I'm just a terrible, person knowing anything about the, what's going on underneath there anyway. But maybe, I'm, maybe this is good for me because now I don't have to worry about it anymore. It'll just be kind of rolling along and uh, just plug it in, you know. I've missed a whole bunch of uh, knowledge that I didn't need. Anyway, um, a lot of jobs are going to be changed fitting this green agenda. Things are going to look different and it's going to mean a lot of changes at that sort of practical uh, energy level. I mean, there's lots of challenges ahead because one of the nice things about um, fossil fuel is things like you can, I mean, think of issues like the fact you can transport it easily. You know, you take it out of the sand in one country, whip it across to another country and so on. But how do you take energy uh, from, um, uh, wind tunnels and things like this, and how do you transport that across to another country? I mean, where, how does that happen? Where do you, you can do that very easily with oil. You can't do it so easily with other things. And they're exploring lots of different methods. I just listened to a thing on iron being used as a way of getting, moving uh, energy across. So there'll be lots of innovation happening with this, uh, with this new change. But me, being green means more 
I mean, one thing is taking care of the planet, but the other is to realize that we are a part of the planet. You know, it's not just about saving uh, fish in the sea and saving, you know, the animals out there. We, as people, are part of that ourselves. And we're in the business of taking care of people. So that's something that we have, you know, that's where we become sort of fully engaged in this whole process. One of the things, um, and there's some concepts I think that really apply here, the idea of career flow where the things we love to do and the things we're good at come together. I think that's so important in terms of understanding who we are and what we're about and are we getting the most out of the uh, the people that are here, you know, are we, are we really taking full advantage of the potential of what we could be? And if you think of it, and, I, and some of you who know me know I like to think in metaphors, you know, one of the, one of the issues, of course, it, with the um, fossil fuels is that, yes, it does a lot of good things, but it also leaves this very negative residue, right? It changes the, uh, envi the air around us and stuff like that. Well, you can take that same idea and apply it to people. There's a lot of good things that are happening for people, but a lot of people are being left behind. There's a lot of things that aren't so good for people. That are, there's a lot of, and one of the things that somebody in this career development field I know, there's a lot of people I meet in their 40s and 50s who say, I've hated my job, I hated it from the beginning, I wish I'd never done that, I wish, you know, there, this idea of, you know, being uh, dispirited and discouraged and, and not happy with one's life, that's, you know, that's part of the residue. That's, from a metaphorical perspective, that's the people residue, you might say. And I think one of the things that we have to do is we have to get, we start to start understanding people differently and really understanding those moments, you know, what is it that makes you happy, the joy? What is it, the, those frustration moments? And really getting a sense of people and who they are and what they're all about and how can we bring more joy into life? You know, how can we avoid that negative residue? Does it really have to be like that? Could we make it a bit better for people? Could we? help them find, you know, if somebody finds what they're really passionate about, what they're interested in, they have a good life in front of them. They get involved in something else where, you know, every day is a drudgery and they hate, they're okay at doing it, but they don't, you know, really engage with it. Imagine, it's like a, a jail sentence in some ways, you know, and they go on and on and on with this and pretty soon get trapped and have the sense that they can't get out. They're stuck. So that's that residue. Green helps us make the most of our collective strengths. It focuses on diversity and, you know, taking care of not just the, you know, I think one of the nice things about this conference is the fact the, the focus on the Aboriginal ass, you know, this year. I mean, there's a focus on that, on that every year, but the idea that we need reconciliation, that we need to sort of bring people together, that we need to recognize our diversity and then come together. And we need that, and especially now, we're having all, whole groups of new immigrants coming, and it's so interesting for me being in Ottawa and going down to the mall now and seeing, you know, just sitting around the food fair shouldn't sit around the food fair too long, but uh, you sort of look at people and, you know, some of the foods there that, that wouldn't have been Ottawa 10 years ago. You know, people weren't eating that kind of food, but they're there now, they're part of the Nordstrom Food Fair, you know, and you think, how did they get in here? You know, what's, ch it's changed. And the, and you can see it everywhere. You see it in the hotels, take a look, I mean, some of us are staying in the Westin, and you know they have special deals for people who do green and 
clean your own room instead of having somebody else do it. And, you know, it's all around us, and it's going to continue to grow, I think. This idea of lifelong learning and development is also something that I'm particularly interested in at the moment. It has, uh, I mean, how do we keep, get the most out of our population in terms of, you know, not putting people out to pasture, not retiring people, but engaging people, and engaging people in ways that sort of continues to draw on the, the intellect and the skills and the strategy. You know, how do we make lifelong guidance and a reality? And this is all part of being green. This is part of not leaving large groups of people and situations behind, but making sure that we're you're sort of making the best of it, making the most of it, which is the essence of, of being green. So green is more than just something one does. It's not... I think one of the things that disappoints, disappoints me sometimes when I look at what people are saying or doing about being green is they look at it as like a little hat you can put on. Okay, I'm going to put my green hat on or a, you know, and there, what, what do I need to do to be green, you know? And you do something. And I think it's more, it, it's also, an, you have to be authentic about it. It needs to be a way of being not just something you do, not something you just pick up. And it has to, there has to be consistency between values and who you are in the world. It needs to be sort of really become an integral part of the person. And it requires justice, you know, social justice, and attempts to make the world a better place. I mean, that's being green, make the world a better place. Well, that, that applies to people as well as to the air we breathe. So here's a question, and I think this is a question that the career guidance needs. We need to help people assess the careers they choo are choosing. How do those careers fit with who they are and how does doing that help to make the world a better place? I mean, do we ever ask that question or are we sort of stuck on, hey, you got a job, good for you, great, you know, like, take off, that's it, you know, you got something there. Do we ever bring up the second question or these questions about, is this the best job for you? And how, do you, how are you going to make the world a better place through, through involvement in that activity? And that's a bigger kind of question. That's taking us um, out of a pretty narrow sphere and into something where we're starting to sort of locate the person within the broader environment, within the context. And I think that requires a different kind of career development. It's going to stretch us in ways that we, we uh, haven't even thought of yet, because that's... But I think to be green and to bring green, to greenness to career development, we're going to have to think in this broader sort of way. So who's asking questions like that? Well, I think people of all ages are asking that. But I'm really impressed with some of the stuff that young people are, are saying to me about, you know, they want to make a difference. They want to do something. They're asking those kind of questions. And you know what? So are some of the, my contemporary older friends asking the same kind of questions. How do I continue to make a difference? How can I help somebody? What can I do? What can I do to, to make the world a better place? And I think everybody in between is asking that too. But those are two groups in particular that I'm, uh, I'm familiar with. So what is, what is career, green career development? What does it look like? Well, one of the things I think it, has, it needs to start with passion. You know, what do you, what do you want, what do you want? What do you really, what really excites you? What is it that gets you going? And we, we need to teach people to ask questions, not how intelligent are you, but how are you intelligent? You know, what's your, what's your intelligence? You know, everybody's intelligent. It's just, 
how they are intelligent. What's, what's the way in which they, what's the type of talent that they have, the way in which they can uh, engage with the world. I think green career development connects with like-minded people. Who we are isn't determined just by us. Identity is formed by the people around you. It's the way in which people see you. you your identity isn't self-determined. It's the things that people, how they treat you and what they say to you and, and the way in which you're held in the world. And that gives you identity as much as your own ideas about who you are. I think green career development supports risk-taking, creativity, flexibility, about doing and being and doing something different. And yes, it means exploring labor market opportunities and looking at ways in which you can fit into new, a new changing world. And it's, it's so different, you know, when I talk to my son-in-law who's the graphic designer and working in the IT industry and, you know, people just, they think nothing of changing jobs. It's just like, they're in this job, then they're in this job, then they're here, they're there, until they find that spot where people treat them, that they treat them in ways in which they feel that they matter in which the people treat them as they feel like they're doing something important. And when people have feelings like that, then they stay. And it isn't the money. It's how you're treated. Who's to, how, what's the relationships like? And these are kind of things that we need to take into, a, uh, into account in, in uh, green career d development. Here's a little exercise I want you just to engage with. I can't, I can't do a talk without getting people to do an exercise. I'm so used to doing that. It's, uh, so let, let's, what's the difference between creating and problem solving? So let's start, I want you just to do this uh, yourself in terms of think about a difficult problem in your life. You know, and you've got to problem solve what that solution is like. What do you, when you're thinking of a problem, what are you thinking and feeling and how are you going to get around it? You got a, got a sense of what that might be like? Some people maybe don't have any problems, but if you don't think of a friend's problem that... <laughs> and then there's creating, all right? So now take a step back from that. Take a step back from the problem solving, which we were doing just a minute ago, and now let's jump into something, into a creating mode. So take a breath. Think about something you'd like to create, something that you'd love to make happen, a dream maybe that you haven't been able to realize. And what are, what are you thinking and feeling now? So what's the difference between creating and problem solving? Many people with problem solving, when they, sometimes they get discouraged, overwhelmed, anxious, dispirited, hopeless. There's a sense of focusing on the problem. It's a problem. How am I going to get around it? It's not easy. It's, you know, there is that sense of hard work here. When people are creating, there's a more energy, a more a sense of hopefulness, excitement about possibility, readiness to make it happen. If you've ever done any kind of uh, creative work, creative crafting or something like that, you know, there's times when things don't work when it doesn't, you don't get it quite right, and you have to undo whatever you've done, and you try it again. But within a creating mindset, it's very different than in a problem solving, where you sort of try to go someplace, and ah, it didn't work, and you know, the frustration that that might bring. This is a, ni a nice quote from uh, Bruce Elkin. To transcend problems and complexity, Shift your focus from solving problems to creating what matters. When you get it right, your problems will shrink, even dissolve. 
with a creating focus, you're more relaxed, you're better able to flow. So I think that's the mindset we want. This is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be creating. We're not necessarily going to be problem solving. When people are in the problem solving mode, it tends to be more linear, less, less flexible. The positive energy flow is different. Uh, whether there's, it's a temporary solution or a long-term uh, perspective. Creating is less win or lose and there's more of a enjoying the journey. You know, how much of us, how many of us really enjoy the journey, enjoy the trip? You know, we sort of, or are we focused on just getting there? You know, what are we going to do when we get there? These are the kind of questions I think we need to be asking. What matters to you? And what type of life would you like to create for yourself? Let's talk about creating a life for yourself. And how does your career choice fit with who you are and with making the world a better place? So we're expanding that a bit. And what needs to be done in order to get there, to make it a reality? And let's just talk about what's the first step. You don't have to have it all worked out. That's the one thing I think we learned in career development is that you can't really predict the future. Things have, you know, if you look at the theories about career development and the way things have changed, people now realize those ideas you have as a young person, often they go, you know, you, there's very few people who are sitting here today who knew that this is what they wanted and this is where they were going to be and things like that. Life happens and you have to take a step and then you reevaluate and you take another step and then on it goes. You don't necessarily have to have the whole pathway all worked out. And I think many people are really frustrated and discouraged because they think that's what they should know. And if they really just looked around and asked people their own stories, they'd find out that most people didn't have it all figured out either. You know, everybody, you just took a step. You don't need to know what you want to be at the end of university. You just have to know to get in there. Take a step and get your first, you know, get in the first year. And then you take another one and another one. And then you change majors and, you know, on it goes. One of the things that I like to do, and, and some of you know this, is I, I, I like involving people in an activity called walking the problem. And... Um, it's also called the miracle question, but some of the work I'm doing now with career development focuses more on getting people physically involved, actually moving them. I think too much of what we do is just sitting and talking and, you know, whatever, and asking people to think about what is it that you, where are you at in the problem space? You want to get over to the other side? So get them, to, don't just sit in a chair with them, but have them actually experience the problem space. And then they move over here. Problem solved. Now I'm on the top of the mountain. Rather than, we always solve problems in one direction. We take people, from a problem and we move them towards a solution. We, and we march them along this way towards, it's like we take them from the bottom of the hill and they move them up. But what if we said, let's start, that's the wrong place to start. Start from where you want to get to. Okay, now you're here. Now look back to where you came from. It always looks and feels different when you're at the top of the hill rather than when you're at the bottom. And now we just need to work out the details. Okay, so you hear, okay, ooh, you're going to have to get around this chair here. So how are you going to do that? What's your strategy? You know, get people to move, to sort of start feeling the change, not only intellectually, but feeling it in their body. 
and walking and talking and solving issues. The best conversations I've ever had with my children, with other people's children, are in the car when we're driving together somewhere, walking with them. Why have we just, why do we continue to put guidance into such a small box? Say, okay, you put two chairs together and you gotta sit and talk like, that fits for some people, but it's not good enough for many. So let's, let's start working, let's do methods and situations that are more, um, whoa. All right, there's a problem. I'm gonna to have to get around that one. Didn't even see that one. That's a, the invisible problem. Uh, so, you know, these are the kinds of exercises and activities that I'm, I really think we need to start working at and developing a, a different style of doing business. Not so much just sitting around talking and filling in forms, but getting people physically engaged in what they're doing. I also think we need to really help people learn from experience. And I mentioned earlier the idea of metaphors and the, idea, and the notion that um, we learn from the past and we take that into the future. When people are facing any kind of problem, they've, they've experienced other, they've solved problems in other parts of their life back here. And so helping them to understand what they did here and how they might be able to use that to apply it over here to this situation. So you learn not from just studying the issue, this problem, but then say, no, is this the first challenge you've ever had? And we have all these refugees and immigrants coming here. And one of the things I've learned in working with refugees and immigrants is the fact that often they don't have as much trouble with unemployment because they've faced a lot of problems a lot tougher than that. I mean, they've been shot at and people have, you know, and they've been in situations where they're they might drown and they've had this and, this and they say to me, yeah, it's a problem, but you know, I've been in worse. You know, this isn't the worst thing that's ever happened to me. Everybody has solved problems at some point in their life and getting them to sort of learn from that experience. What did they do? What was, what was your strategy? How did you get through that? What, what happened here? Okay, that's, we can take that now. That's the knowledge you have. And let's bring that over to this getting around the chair business that we're talking about and see if we can use some of that same stuff from over there and apply it here. And of course, you don't have to just learn from your own experience, you can learn from the experience of other people. It's not, and you learn the, and you hear the stories from other people. And what did they do, and how did they handle it? And, and so I think a focus on narrative and story, and helping people to hear each other's stories and learn from them, and then take that knowledge and information and pull it forward. And that's the metaphoric process, you know, this idea we take knowledge over here and we pull it over here and we try it out. It doesn't fit exactly, but there's enough that sort of gives us something to go on. Does that make some sense? Here's another good question, a couple of good quotes from Robinson. Activities we love fill us with energy even when we're exhausted, physically exhausted. Activities we don't, they can drain us in minutes even if we approach them at our physical peak of fitness. When we connect with our own energy, we're more open to the energy of other people. The more alive we feel, the more we can contribute to the, li to the lives of others. So how do we make ourselves and our clients come alive? And I think in a green world, 
Being alive is essential. And how do we get that feeling of, yes, I'm here and I'm alive and this is, life is wonderful and whatever that might be. And it, it's, um, you know, and people come alive when they're doing things that they enjoy. When they have, uh, when they're with people that they enjoy. And how do we help them discover, to learn what that is, to understand those nuggets of information, this, what I call the psychological DNA, the pieces of us that are very unique to each of us. How do we understand that? And then move it forward, move it into what we, where we want to go. And we're not always going to have, doesn't mean that every job and every experience you have is always going to be fantastic and wonderful and we're all going to be happy all the time. But I think we need to help people understand the journey. I worked with one immigrant who, he was taking uh, cooking training and he had come from Guatemala and he was a professor in the university and he was crying. And I said, well, why are you crying? He says, well, they said, that's all you'll ever get. You know, that's, what, that's for you. You know, the, you know he was a uh, professor of uh, political science, and the employment counselor had told him, you will be a cook. And that's the jo there's jobs in cooking, and that's what we got for you. Now, he can uh, take that if he knows it's part of the journey, if it's part of the movement, you know, if he can accept that. But if it's, that's the end point, then it's a problem. Here's some final thoughts. Um, I think career development is more than just helping clients prepare for another job search sales campaign. You know, I think sometimes we get too caught up in the salesmanship of job search and finding out what you can do, and we take it as just, you know, helping people. You've got to learn this tactic, and you have to learn that tactic. You've got to look like this and act like this, and, you know, we don't think about them as humans and what do they want and what do they, we sort of, we're, we're helping them get somewhere, but it's not necessarily where they want to get to. And sometimes I think we can buy into that image of the, uh, the metaphor of the sales campaign too much. You know, that we, we are really just helping people get, where, get something where the jobs are, rather than saying, where, where's the best place for you to land not necessarily where are the opportunities right at this particular moment. And help people to, to build these plans, these pathways of possibility. You know, I was working with a, a lawyer from Russia, and you know, what he, he's, he's driving a truck in Vancouver, and he's feeling like, you know, what's, you know, he's deflated and things like that. And he said, the first thing he has to do, he has to learn English. So we started, you know, and, he, and of course, driving a truck isn't the best place to learn English. You're sitting in a truck driving around, and he also was working in a place where all the owners were of a different nationality, and they were speaking a different language. So he hardly spoke any English. So getting... But when you start to sort of ladder, where you show people, okay, you do this and you do that, and he actually had skills in renovation. And I said, you know, it'd be a lot better to work in housing and building and be a part of a crew. That'll get you your English, which might get you this, which might get you to becoming a notary, which then you might even get on to becoming a lawyer. So you start building a pathway for people, and I think that's important. I also think we need, to, we need to start focusing on creating an authentic experience where practitioners and clients feel that they really matter, that they're important, that they're significant, that they count. 
And we tell people you count. Oh, yes, you're really important. And then I ask people, what do you do when important people come to visit you? I mean, what happens when important people come around? Food comes out, people come to greet them. You know, there's lots of things that happen that there's lots of ways of telling people they matter. And a lot of them are sort of very subtle. So it, is, it isn't just the words, but it's the way, I mean, when you do have, if you're in a, working in an office somewhere and an important person comes, what do you do to get ready for that person? And think about then, how do you get ready for your clients? Are they as important as you say they are? You know, or is it a very different kind of experience? And, and I, I, a lot of things, I focus on things like the importance of offering people a drink. You know, like, would you like a drink of water? Would you like a cup of coffee? Something like that. That's what we do when people important come around. We offer them drinks. We offer them, you know, that. We have lots of little methods like this, but we need to create a situation where we really create, help people feel they matter, but practitioners also need to feel that they matter. And that means the people in the offices who are managing them need to create climates, because it's pretty hard if you're feeling you don't matter in your organization, but at the same time, you're supposed to give out the mattering, but you don't get much of it coming your way. So you have to have both. So let's create hope. You know, let's, let's build a sense of hope and possibility, act with integrity, and start with a servant heart. You know, start with the idea of how can we help? What can we do? What can, how can I help you? How can I serve you in some way? Um, and Sometimes that might mean not necessarily just giving them exactly what they want. Sometimes you have to help people understand that what they want right now might not be the best for them and get them to find their own sense of, you know, but it's a journey together. It's a togetherness. It's walking with them. It's walking alongside them. Let's create some sparks of energy. You know, let's... Let's light up the sky. Let's make some things happen out there. And this is an exciting opportunity. This is a time to do something different, to act in new ways, to become, um, I, I guess, to become the green force that we could, you know, to really get a sense of, make, of bringing out the fullest level of potential uh, from the people we're serving. And let's include them in, let's bring people in, let's help them find where they fit best and become a real source, uh, I guess, of, of energy. Um, I mean, we are, green career development isn't just about oil in the ground and about wind turbines. It's also about people and making people fly high. And I think we're in the business of helping them take off, find their wings, get to where they want to be, and that's our contribution to this. I think we have a tremendous opportunity now because the political bosses are all thinking this is a great idea, so if if there's that energy in the country, if there's that energy in, the, in, in politics, not only nationally but internationally, let's get on board with it. So thank you very much. That was amazing. Thank you very much. No problem.